Hi, everyone. Uh, he's Chris Crow. I'm Stephen Atwell. We're here to talk about uh, database DevOps and the benefits of leveraging uh, continuous delivery for stateful applications. Yeah, and I'm uh, uh, Chris Crow with, uh, with Portworx, and Stephen and I have been working on a few different, different talks just about integrating various data tests inside of delivery pipelines. Uh, using various tools and, and all sorts of things. It's kind of been a fun talk. We, uh, gosh, started this a, a couple of years ago. We were at Data on Kubernetes Day last year, but this, um, I guess, project started a little, a little before that based on uh, one of your previous employers and a particular problem that they had that I never quite explained right for however many times we've done this. Yeah, so uh, at a past employer of mine, um, we were building a, a BI solution with a custom reporting layer and a custom database and very, very, very configurable. And the most important bugs in that product were also the hardest to find. And the only reliable way we ever found to find them uh, basically amounted to copying down every customer's configuration, standing it up on the old version and the new version, comparing the numbers. And you know, when I was there, we, we, we spent several years at one point going and getting that all automated. And when Chris and I started talking, uh, he, he showed me how easy it is with Kubernetes suddenly to go and automate the pieces of that that were the hardest. Um, and right after I, I told him the story, like two days later, we had a meeting and he showed up with a working version. Um, and we've talking about, been talking about that and, and variants of it ever since. So, you I know. had more time on my hands back then. Now I have a nine month old at home. So that's a whole yeah, different, different level of. Um, yeah, time to be able to play with technology. Hence why uh, Stephen is running the, the laptop this particular particular time. But yeah, that's the thing I find the most interesting or one of the most fun things for me about Kubernetes is being able to have my entire app packaged on there and have it be, uh, have a lot of tools to actually make that portable. And it occurs to me if I'm going to look at any of the slides, I have to look over your shoulder here because this is going to get awkward. So uh, somebody dial 9-1 and then uh, if I fall down, dial 1 again. Yeah, so Chris and I like interacting with the audience. So let's do a quick poll. Who here likes barbecue? Put up your hand if you like barbecue. Okay, we got, we got a few. Cool, so, so Chris and I on, on the side have a hypothetical restaurant chain that runs off uh, some open source uh, software. And we're gonna be using uh, some of the management software for our, our barbecue restaurant uh, as we talk through today. So our, our application is uh, basically tracks uh, the inventory of available food across all of the restaurants. And it's a fairly simple architecture. It's a web app with a, fr with a front end written in JavaScript, back end written in Go, uh, talking to a uh, Microsoft SQL Server on the back end, um, and then storing it, running inside Kubernetes, storing its data on a persistent volume. And simple applications very quickly become complicated when you care about things like never taking any downtime. <laughs> so, I told you the app, this is, this is the environment we're actually running in. Um, so we don't have one Kubernetes cluster, we've got two, we're gonna use both during today's talk. Uh, one's staging, the other's production. And they're set up to be able to replicate uh, all of the data between them, uh, leveraging uh, the Portworx storage layer. We also are leveraging Argo CD in order to go and uh, deploy manifests to these Kubernetes clusters throughout the talk. We're leveraging Git because that's obviously when you're doing GitOps where everything lives. We're leveraging Harness in order to orchestrate Argo CD, and we're also leveraging uh, Harness Database DevOps in order to do database schema migrations. One thing that is uh, new this year, so last year when we talked about it, we talked application changes, we talked upgrading the version of the database inside the CI CD pipeline. No. The pipeline we're running today can do both of those. But what we're gonna focus on today is actually migrating the database schema um, to add new columns, which can also be done in the CI-CD pipeline. And since it's been somewhat of an evolving talk, right, this is a lot of the principles here are the main thing that, um, and maybe I should ask, was anybody at our Data on Kubernetes Day talk in Chicago? Oh, no one, okay, entirely new audience. All right, so um, the, one of the most important things uh, about these sorts of pipelines is no matter what the change is, and today we're gonna be doing a schema change as well as an application change, is that we're testing the entire thing end to end. So this could even be an infrastructure change or whatever the thing is, and, and uh, hopefully with this, everything will go just fine and we won't have a, have a problem. Um, 
Yeah. But this gives us a way of ensuring that uh, with as much verisimilitude as possible that we have a functioning application before we roll that in back into production or roll the change into production. Yeah, and if you, if you ever want have a co-speaker and you want to make them nervous at KubeCon, tell them like a week beforehand that your home lab where your talk's running in has been tripping breakers. It, uh, it makes everyone feel good. I've learned about uh, AFCI circuits, apparently, so my wife is actually uh, by the circuit breaker right now in case that trips. So when I was checking my phone, it wasn't being necessarily idle. I was waiting for a notification in case something had had tripped because yes, this is actually running uh, out of my house in Tacoma, Washington. So, because after all, um, why not have a live demo in front in front of an, an audience? That that's, that sounds like a, a good way to control blood pressure. <laughs> so, you know, what's the process we're going to be running through on our CI/CD pipeline today? Um, so, we're going to uh, go and. Uh, test with live production data in our staging environment. So we're gonna start by scaling down our stage, staging database and then triggering a copy of all the data in our persistent volume from production to staging. Um, that copy is triggered by deploying a uh, migration CRD to the production cluster. And I should say that this sort of migration can be, uh, because obviously um, I, I'm using a, a portwork CRD in order to, to trigger this migration, but anything that can get data from, from one side to another uh, can also be used to push this around. The idea, though, is that these PVC, these persistent volumes are living inside of Kubernetes, and we're going to have an exact copy of them go over to our staging environment. After the, the database comes back up with our copy of production data, we're then going to go ahead and change the database schema. For the database schema today, we're going to be introducing a couple new columns. I'll walk through the details of what the use case is and what the change we're making is in just a couple of minutes. After the database comes up, we're then going to deploy a new version of the application that depends on those database changes. And we're then going to look, make sure everything's working as expected. And if it's not, we'll roll back. So what's, what, what's the change for today? So we mentioned that the application we're using tracks food inventory across our barbecue restaurant chain. And our barbecue restaurant chain needs to open a new location. It's opening one in Boston, Georgia. Unfortunately, we already have a barbecue restaurant in Boston, Massachusetts. And our data, database schema only has a single column tracking location. And right now, the word that's in there is Boston, which is a bit of a problem. It seems like a bit short-sighted for, uh, yeah, actually uh, the data schema here for, I don't know, some reason, almost like it wasn't our day job when we built this. So, you know, we, we want to expand that. So we're what we're going to do as our change is we're going to introduce two new columns to our warehouses table. Those two new columns are going to identify the city and the state. We're going to keep the location column, and we're keeping location because it's currently used by our inventory tracking table as a foreign key. So we want to still be able to do that join. However, we're no longer going to be displaying location. We're going to be displaying city and state. This is fairly simple so far, but our, our, our boss, the, the pig who owns our barbecue chain, his name is Frank. Yeah, I'm not making this up. There, we, there's stuff. We have ones plush dolls booth. somewhere in uh, in KubeCon, so if you see people around with the, the plush, that is Frank. He doesn't let us take downtime. Yes, it's just a barbecue restaurant, but we're open 24/7, 365. And because of this, we need the old version of the application and the new version of the application to be able to run simultaneously, because no matter how quickly we switch over. If we're taking no downtime, they're both going to be running for at least a few milliseconds. So because of that, we've also set up some triggers that are syncing the location column to the city and the state column in both directions. And thus, if data is edited by the new version of the app, it gets synced back to location to be seen by the old version. And similarly, if it's edited by the old version of the app, it will sync back to the new. When we get to production, that's going to be really important. That's, 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 this will be important later. <laughs> So we're going to go, and go ahead and do a demo. Fingers crossed. Yeah, send some, some good vibes out to Tacoma. Yeah, and I'm going to remember 
to edit the data in Oh, prod. yeah, because after all, since we're using a production, uh, a copy of the production data, let's actually add something to the production data, you know, so yeah. you can see that we don't actually have any tricks up our sleeves. So cool, this is, this is the application we're using, and I mentioned it's an inventory tracking system. So I'm gonna come over and I'm gonna add to our Barcelona location. Yes, we're a very, very large barbecue restaurant chain. We're international, if anyone's wondering. Very good barbecue. And we're West Coast add... style barbecue, actually, I was told, told today by one of the other employees. Hmm. You, ever, uh, you know, because everyone's heard of West Coast barbecue, right? No. <laughs> so we just added 20 units to Barcelona of brisket. So you'll notice in the tooltip there, there's 165 units of brisket in Barcelona in prod. If I go and I look at the staging uh, environment, it's only got 145 units of brisket. So we'll look at that number again partway through our pipeline so that you can see that yes, we're actually moving, moving the data around and testing with production data like we're saying. Over here in Git, I have a change ready to commit that's going to add the, uh, the database change I just walked through. Walking through this change, um, it's broken down into a couple independent uh, changes. Um, the first one adds the two new columns that we talked about to the warehouses table. After we've added those, we then go and we set the triggers that are gonna sync the data. And then after we set the triggers, we do a one-time copy of the data from the location column over to the city column. For this one-time copy of the data, we are copying it one row at a time with a per row transaction to ensure we don't lock that whole table up during the copy. Because as you've seen, we have a lot of restaurants, we've got a lot of inventory. It takes some time to copy a billion rows of data. We don't have a full billion, but you know, again, we're not we'll allowed we'll even a second of downtime. And then last but not least, we're adding the new row for Boston, Georgia to the warehouses table. When I made that change, uh, Harness detected and kicked off a pipeline. Um, on, this, on this UI, all of these rows, these are various migrations I've run on my database. All of the columns are various database instances. So we're currently deploying to the staging Argo instance and we're deploying the set of changes that we previously rolled back. Hopping over here, we can see our pipeline. And while we were talking, it started by going and shutting down the database in staging. Now that staging is offline, we're going and migrating the data from production to staging. And this takes a little bit of time because again, it's a real world database and we are actually you know, copying two between clusters. two Kubernetes clusters. Either side of a bedroom in my house, 56K modem between the two, you know, how it goes. You upgraded to a 56K. I've, I had a US Thank robotics you. back from 1994. He used to be running these on some Hayes 2600s. It was, took forever. <laughs> so we're currently copying the data. Once the, once the data is copied, we're gonna spin back up the database and then we'll go through the rest of the migration. Uh, this, this takes a second, so while we wait for the migration, did anyone have any questions on anything we, we've shown you guys so far? Cool. Have to stall long enough for time, because yeah, so we're to, and in this particular case, we're just taking the uh, persistent volume and the PVC over, uh, because obviously we want to deploy uh, new versions of the applications over on, yeah. the, on the staging side. So our staging database uh, is back up, the migration finished, so now we're gonna go ahead and deploy the changes to the database schema. What our pipeline's gonna do in order to do that is it's gonna start by reaching out to Git and cloning down the current desired state of the database. It's then gonna query the production database to see which migrations have already been run relative to what's in Git to figure out which changes need to be applied, which changes need to be rolled back, et cetera. Once it's figured out those changes, it's gonna run it through a governance layer in order to ensure that, you know, it's not doing anything Frank the Pig has said we're not allowed to do, such as dropping data in production. Um, assuming everything looks good, we'll then move on to apply the changes. On this right-hand side, you can see all of the various database changes that have been deployed. Um, these white rows, these are the changes that were deployed prior that uh, is not quite expected, so let me take a quick peek at that. This is why I love live demos. I'm gonna go ahead and just rerun. 
from and the And importantly, last any of these sorts of, of failures are only happening inside of the staging environment, which is why we're doing this exercise in the first place every time we go through, um, uh, every time we go through this pipeline. Yeah, looked like, uh, looked like the staging database server might not have been back, quite back up yet. Oh. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, rerun that. Um, but basically, assuming all looks good with the changes, we'll get them applied. There was a real test that I probably needed to add to make sure that database was actually back up instead of the, uh, the sleep timer. Just graybeard bash programmers, suddenly, you know, it gets late at night and, yeah, sleep timer is just as good as a real check, right? Yeah. Right? No. Cool. So, so, so this time all went good. The database is running again. Life, li life is happy. So uh, we're currently going and running the changes through our governance engine. And as you can see on the right-hand side, these three changes just popped up in green. So those are the, the new changes we're applying that we previously checked in to Git. Um, after they are applied, we're going to add a tag to the database. And what that tag is is it creates a rollback point um, so that if at any future point in time we need to roll back to here, we can. Um, and you know, having those kind of before and after every change is really important so that you can undo that change. And not being a DBA, this is something that's pretty common to be able to, uh, because it, you want to keep those around, I guess, longer than I expected in, in talking about this. Yeah, so like most databases, once you commit a transaction, they don't have a way to roll back those changes natively. Um, they don't have an equivalent of like kubectl rollout undo. Um, but most of the database change management frameworks have a way to keep track of which changes were applied and tag particular states uh, in that so that you can then go back to any of those past states very easily. Um, cool, so right now we've deployed the new version of our schema. We haven't yet deployed the new version of our application. Um, and the reason for that is in order to not take downtime in prod, it's really important that the old version of our application still works with the new version of our schema. So let's test that. Here I am in staging. Before I refresh, quantity of brisket is 145. Now it's 165, so. All right, that worked. We, we actually have the production data, life's good. And you know, similarly, if I click around a little bit, like it, it basically looks like everything's working. So let's go ahead and deploy the new version of the application. So a lot of the time when you're dealing with stateful applications, Small minor features like adding a state column require you to ship a new schema change and a new application version kind of in lockstep because those changes are tightly coupled. So now we just reached out to Argo. And we told it to sync down the application manifest and that's going to go ahead and give us the new version of the application. And you know, Clicking around, life looks, life looks reasonably good, except when I come over to manage inventory now, I'm no longer seeing cities or states at all, which is probably not ideal. And that's be because- It'd be really of, hard to change around inventory. Yeah, and, and, and it turns out that's, that, that's because of a bug, bug in my UI where uh, it does it automatically update the client to the new version. I should, uh, I should probably fix that before we reach prod. But you know, if I hold shift and I hit refresh, now, now I can see it. But, you know, only Boston, Georgia has a state because I didn't in my change put in states for any of the other cities. I should mm. probably fix that too. Yeah. So, you know, maybe I'm not quite ready to take this all the way to prod. So, cool, I've deployed this to a shared environment. It's not ready. I want to go back to my dev environment. How do I get all of this back? So you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the time when you're you're doing database migrations, um, there is sometimes a way to roll back. They're they're frequently referred to as undo migrations, and it's what's the inverse set of operations to do what you previously did. And you want to be careful when you're using them in prod because, for example, if you create a new table of data and you undo that, you've just deleted the table of data. So certain operations create table, create column it's often a good idea to not roll back. But most operations you can, such as, for example, the triggers we set up. And in this case, we're actually in a staging environment because there's a few different ways to handle a failure in the application um, that happens, right? We are syncing this data from production. We could simply resync it. Um, but 
it's also valuable to make sure if this was actually in production to make sure that our rollbacks would have actually worked. So that's the point of this entire staging environment so we can do as many tests uh, on this database as possible. And granted, uh, a good portion of them here are manual. We asked last year for people to submit automated tests to us, and you know, we got the, uh, a number somewhere hovering around between zero and one with a margin of error of one. Um, but eventually I'll get to it uh, in between sleepless nights with a baby and that sort of thing. Yeah, so okay. you know, where I'm doing these manual checks, we could be running a test suite, um, still accepting <laughs> contributions of a test suite. The window's still open. So here I'm, I'm just prompting, hey, do you, want to, uh, do you want to continue deploying or do you want to roll this back? I'm going to go ahead and trigger a rollback. So we deployed our application. We also deployed our database. A lot of companies, if they need to roll that back, that database rollback, that's by hand. The application rollback, you know, for a stateless application, that's really easy. Yeah. For a stateful application, oftentimes that entire deployment, because of the database change, companies have disabled the automated pipeline for so we started by rolling back the application, just you know, effectively running a kubectl rollout undo. And then we went through and we ran the, uh, well, still running, the undo migrations. So we reached out to Git, pulled down the, the uh, migration state, and then we're rolling back to that tag that existed at the beginning of this demo so that we can get back. And as you can see, we just rolled back. So if I pull back up that summary screen, that shows everywhere we deployed. We had deployed these changes out to staging. We just rolled them back again. All right, let's see how the application looks. Yeah, so if I come back to the application and I, and, and I refresh, well, now my pick list doesn't work at all. And that's because of that same client caching problem that I mentioned. <laughs> so I really need to make my, my web UI a little bit smarter when I deploy it. But if I hold shift and I hit refresh again, you can see that now we're on the old version of the, of the UI, old version of the database schema. Everything's working the same way it was. The only thing we've changed since the beginning of this demo is, hey, we still copied the data from production. So if I come and I check Barcelona, it's still going to be 165. So that's some of the power of the things you can do by leveraging data inside your CI CD pipeline. Quick recap of what we've shown you. We've shown you how you can deploy and roll back changes to your application, your database schema, and your running database server version all simultaneously. When we were deploying and syncing the application manifests to Git, we were, we were syncing and updating all three. We did a little bit of a deep dive into a real-world database change. That database change was handling a real-world situation where we needed to break a single location column out into two columns, city and state. We covered some of the considerations that you need to think about when you're doing a schema change that are unique to stateful applications if you want to ensure that you can upgrade with zero downtime. We rolled back our change, and we covered how you can do database rollbacks. Now, this particular example was that schema change. In the past, in, in some of these demos, we have uh, uh, done Mongo upgrades. and. Um, yeah, had to fake the breaking. I can, I'm, I'm great at breaking stuff, so you have a quick script that, that blows something up. Um, but an example of an actual database upgrade inside of Kubernetes that was running out of a staging environment. Same thing with application upgrades, but for each of these changes, being able to test everything end to end to ensure that it all works before we roll this into production, and to be able to do that automatically instead of a bunch of manual tests with a release point, because the faster we can have these iterations and tests and results, well, the faster we can ship new features, that we can actually test things and, and have a good assurance that it's going to work uh, for us. Yeah. At the end of the day, what's, what's everyone trying to optimize with software delivery today? They're trying to decrease the amount of time between that feature being built and it reaching production. And, it re and the longer your code sits on a branch somewhere, the higher the likelihood is something else in the app is going to change that's going to break you. And the higher the cost of fixing that bug is, because by the time you realize it's broken, the developer has switched on to something else. And the more times you context switch, the slower you are. No. So that's why you care about being able to leverage data in your CI CD pipelines.
Yeah, so look at some of the, the previous talks. There's other exa examples around tools. I mentioned, you know, the, uh, the data mover. We uh, obviously used Argo here to deploy the manifest. You can use uh, other things. Uh, having a workflow engine that can actually talk to multiple clusters, trigger the Argo syncs, uh, is always, always important. I think I have one blog where I did it entirely with Argo, and it gets, uh, it gets a, little, a little complex. So uh, if you do a, a, the right Google search, I'm sure you can find it. Or find me later. I'll, I'll get, you a, get you a link to it. Cool. So I think that's pretty much everything we had we had planned. I went ahead and kicked off the, the pipeline again in case uh, anyone oh, yeah, why not? has we'll any keep, further keep questions on it. it. All right. Um, um, any uh, any, questions, any thoughts? questions or thoughts? Comments, death threats, tomatoes. Oh, that we're we're really close by. <laughs> Yeah, so, that, so the, the question was, is there any risks of taking that snapshot that we then use to, to feed into, um, into the staging environment? Absolutely, so a few things to consider. First, if you're taking the snapshot, there should be some for, way of quiescing the database. That usually involves some sort of freeze, thaw, uh, pre-rule, post-rule that is typically database specific. You absolutely want to do that as, as part of this. Keep in mind, though, that what we are feeding is a staging environment. So uh, this is not being used for the purposes of the backup, so you know, take that how you want. If it fails one time out of 100, how much do you care? But I would certainly keep that in mind. Another question we got when we gave this talk uh, Monday, or a version of it Monday, was uh, kind of related to that, was around, well, can I use database-specific things for the delivery truck? Let's use log shipping or something like that. Um, and absolutely. The reason that we, we are using, uh, actually moving it over on the PV level here, though, is because I can use the same workflow for any data type that I may have, because it's great if the only database I'm running is Mongo, but if I also have Postgres, Microsoft SQL, and a lot of other things, and less expertise in them, being able to use the same pipeline structure to push things around can sometimes be helpful. So yeah. hopefully that, that answers that. And to give you an idea of just how generic this pipeline is, the only part of it that is specific to the database that we were using is literally the SQL of the change, um, yeah. which you know, w was you know, dependent on it being a relational database. Um, we have a different barbecue bookkeeper app that's on Mongo. Everything except for like add table, add column to table as concepts works on Mongo. And there we just have to change it to, you know, add requ a required field validator to a collection. Right. Great question. Any other questions? Um, yeah, Mike, uh, I think there's mics are around somewhere. Oh, okay. Oh, maybe. You know what? Yeah. They've moved them back. You know what? I'm going to do this. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. But you have the answer to this one, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. In, in my organization, we personally use uh, ephemeral environments uh, for a lot of things. And we also have a PI and PCI restrictions on databases. So I, I can just elaborate how could I do this using something a little bit more custom uh, instead of the PV migration, but what are you, like, you know, ideas regarding this? So, so, I mean, one part of that is, is definitely around security because we're taking the production copies of the database. You're not mic'd, so let me take it. <laughs> Do people really have a problem here? No, well, it's not being recorded. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the question was, hey, I'm in a PCI compliant environment, so, I need to keep all the PII in a very, very, very specific operating zone. Exactly. Um, and there was a second part as well, which at this point I forgot, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Ephemeral environments. Ephemeral environments. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna do ephemeral environments first. So for everything we showed, if we wanted to make this ephemeral, the extent of what we would do is at the very, very end, we would delete the namespace for staging. At that point, even that namespace is being deployed when we do the sync at the very end, and the entire thing would be torn down at the end. Yeah, actually, actually the ephemeral environments part was just, um, uh, I, I was just trying to put some emphasis in since we don't have a staging, and normally staging also can be PCI compliant sometimes, 
Um, but the, the stress I'm doing is since we use ephemeral environments, we have like stricter policies yeah. on PI and PCI. So quick, quick uh, follow-up question with that. Um, because if the Kubernetes environment is all running ephemeral uh, containers, your data is living somewhere, presumably outside of Kubernetes, right? Yeah, let's say that, just to make it a little bit more complex, let's say I'm using a fully managed database <laughs> from so a cloud provider. This is actually one of the, the reasons for what this, uh, this talk started as, an, as more of an advocacy of why I would choose to run uh, data uh, services on top of Kubernetes and myself, because it's very difficult to pull off the same sort of thing inside of a hosted environment, if that makes sense. Yeah. For, for the PCI compliance side. Um, the company that I did this with originally um, had a lot of very sensitive data um, in our database. The way we dealt with the compliance concerns around it is we set up a, a environment that had the same security regulations in prod and we were, as prod, and we were testing in that. So like, you definitely don't want to pull down to like a lab environment. Um, but you can have a non-production environment that has the same governance rules, and you do all of this there. We have also had some people we've talked to who have done things like this where in the middle they do data anonymization. Um, so, you know, it's on our to-do list one of these days. Uh, one, one of the other apps has is an ordering app, and it has the name of the person who put in the order. And one of these days, I'm going to go write an anonymizer for it that changes out every, every uh, occurrence of C Crow with C Raven. Um, and you, know, you want to do that anonymization in a non-prod environment. And doing that anonymization is going to be very application specific because you need to know right. which columns are the sensitive ones. Um, but if you run an anonymization like that, you can then go and move it out of prod safely, typically. Does that answer your questions? Yeah, actually, and, um, I didn't thought too much before asking, but then, as I told you at the beginning, I could just elaborate. They probably can find like a way that it's less messy than another. But yeah. it feels like um, any type of uh, C CI processor, CD process for database, it's really, really, it has to be really ergonomic to the nature of the application, right? It's not, no way around it. So I would say the, Anything, any pieces that are schema-aware, so like, hey, if you're adding an automated test suite, that's just like for your outside the database tests, it's going to be app-specific. Uh, the schema changes are going to be app-specific. But the actual pipeline logic doesn't need to be. Um, for dealing with the PCI stuff, usually you basically just you, you add, you add an extra hop to get to dev. Um, the main reason we don't do that here is because then you have to wait for, for two copies, um, which we don't want to make you all sit around and do. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Thank and by you. the way, if people want to continue the conversation, um, uh, you can find us at the Portworks booth later, or me at the Portworks booth later today. I can usually uh, get a hold of Stephen. His uh, uh, harness is a, a couple rows down from us, and I think there are tables and stuff around there. Uh, yeah, or we could so talk over pickleball. You know, I'm from Seattle, so that's a, it's a whole thing up there. Yeah. So if any of you want to talk more, uh, we're. We're talking about some of, more of this <laughs> stuff uh, at Porkworks booth later, and then uh, you can also stop by either their booth or Harness booth, and, and yeah. we're happy to set up time to chat with you after. If anyone else has any other questions, we're happy to take them. Otherwise, we oh. are down to uh, one minute left. Hi, more of a pipeline question. Um, when you do the schema changes, what happens to the downstream with the CDC, right? Things plugged in with the CDC for Kafka related things, listening to the CDC changes, or when you roll back, how does, how do you make sure that it truly not impacting the CDC from a pipeline standpoint? Do you care for it in the pipeline or is it downstream's problem? <laughs> so, um, I believe you're, you're uh, to, to restate your question, hey, I'm running like an ETL process that's syncing data from database A to database B. The schema changed. How do you handle my ETL process? Is that? That could be one. It could be, uh, yes, that could be downstream yeah. jobs, or it could be a simple DR 
data from a data center to another data center going via the CDC, right? So yeah, so, so DR, like it's, it's just gonna, everything we showed you here is just gonna automatically sync because it's taking a, a backup of the full schema. And um, sometimes people, you can also do processes like this instead of running off the live production database, running off a backup. Um, for uh, ETL, if your ETL is copying specific columns, you're going to need to go update those ETL scripts to look at the new columns and include them. If it's copying whole tables, uh, which is fairly common, those new columns are gonna come in for free. But your ETL and the applications built on the other end of your ETL are effectively a separate application. So anytime you make a database schema change, you do, you know, if you're changing pieces that you're using in other systems, you wanna make sure those other systems are getting updated as well. And that's another great reason for having that backwards compatibility and that trigger is a lot of databases, especially ones that predate microservices, don't just have one app that runs against them that needs to be using the right schema. So by having that backwards compatibility layer, your ETL could still be looking at that location column. Your new version of the app is there. You haven't deleted that old version. You go update your ETL and you only delete that old schema change and the triggers that are syncing them after that ETL is fully updated. Similarly, I've, I've talked to some companies who have old monolithic apps where they've got you know, 10 different services all connecting back to the same databases owned by different teams and they have to worry about breaking each other. So again, in that situation, you don't remove that compatibility layer until every app is using the new version. Did that answer your question? All right, Thank looks you. like we are definitely out of time, so. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank really you, Really appreciate it.